Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years, to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom, if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century, but modern studies of Eta Carini estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carine releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carine is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carini is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carini experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, Eta Carini was the second brightest visible star after Sirius the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare-ups, Eta Carini has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5. Now astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carini, is quite dim as seen from Earth. But it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carine is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carine is really two stars. Eta Carini A and Eta Carini, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carine C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carine is, without a doubt, one of the strangest looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light-years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carine in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carini's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carini because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant. Placed where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. 
Rho Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova, or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table, and when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close, or more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before, many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The World Astronomy Community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light-years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table, which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in the star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000 plus light years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernovae, and now it finally occurred in real life. 
Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door. Do me a favor, will ya? Try to imagine the first time you went camping. Maybe you went with your parents. Maybe it happened on a class field trip with your schoolmates. Regardless, try to picture, or remember, what it felt like as the day was coming to an end. The sun has set, but there's still some light outside. Let's say you were lying down, trying to rest for a bit. What's the first thing you remember seeing when looking up? If you're anything like me, it was probably the overwhelming number of stars twinkling right before you. These stars, most of which you can see without any fancy devices, are part of the Milky Way. Believe it or not, our amazing galaxy is almost as old as the universe itself. Age aside, it's also a pretty nice place to be. The Milky Way is like a cosmic nursery where new stars are born. And let me tell you, it's home to some of the most fascinating places, at least from what we can see in pictures. Take the Mystic Mountain, an area in the Carina Nebula. Here, things are always splashing and full of energy. That's because of gas columns collapsing and creating crazy opposing jets that are thrown around like acrobats in a circus. It's like a signature move for stars being born, you know? And if you take a look at this awesome picture, you'll see the elements putting on a colorful show. Blue represents oxygen, green is for hydrogen and nitrogen, and red is the sizzling sulfur. Ready for our next stop on our ride through the Milky Way? Check out these huge twisted clouds of interstellar dust and gas hanging out in the center of M16, also known as the Eagle Nebula. We've got ourselves the super cool Pillars of Creation, which are like towering columns where brand new stars like to hide and chill. Now, I know this ain't the first time the Hubble telescopes captured this epic sight, but trust me, this is the most mind-blowingly detailed image yet. The pillars are getting showered with crazy hot ultraviolet light from a bunch mm -hmm. of young stars hanging just outside the frame. These stellar superstars are actually causing the towers of dust and gas to gradually get worn away by their gusty winds. Brace yourself for the numbers, too. These pillars of creation stretch out for about four to five light years. Yeah, it sounds big, but in the grand scheme of things, they're kind of like the cute little siblings of the larger Eagle Nebula, which spans a whopping 70 by 55 light years. The nebula was first spotted back in 1745 by an awesome Swiss astronomer, and it's about 7,000 light years away from our humble abode in the constellation Serpents. Here's the quirky part, though. As productive as it might sound, the Milky Way's star forming activity is quite rare when compared to other galaxies. Astronomers have noticed that the pace at which stars are being born is actually dropping and they're itching to figure out why. But before we can dive into this weird phenomenon, let's look at how stars come into existence in the first place. It's hard for us to know for sure from down here. What we can gather about a star's life cycle comes from looking at those within our local Milky Way. Stars are formed in colder clouds of gas and dust called nebulae. These areas are pretty common throughout most galaxies. These nebulae have low temperatures that are crucial for hydrogen gas to stick together. As the clump gathers more gas, it causes movement, which itself creates energy. When more gas collides with the already formed clump, all that energy transforms into heat. This keeps going until the temperature grows considerably, sparking the birth of a star. The most secure time of a star's life is also known as its main sequence. 
I'll spare you the chemistry lesson, but during this time, the star produces both heat and radiation. It's because of the radiation that there's pressure around a star, and it's also the reason for most of the light found in a certain galaxy. Now let's talk star sizes. The bigger the star, the faster it consumes its fuel. These massive stars shine the brightest, emitting high energy UV light. On the other hand, lower mass brighties live longer, despite not being as shiny as their larger siblings. There's a variety of star sizes in most galaxies we're able to see from down here. Some stars are 0.1% the size of the sun, while others have 10 times its mass. Once a star finishes up its fuel, it welcomes its grand finale and transforms into a faded star. Stars about the same size as the sun or smaller can no longer produce radiation at this stage. Gravity takes over, causing their matter to settle into a white dwarf. For bigger stars, the timeline changes a bit. They too collapse, but there's a lot more stuff burning, and it's also hotter in there. This collapse creates a stronger core. When all of the star's insides are done for, the outer layers collapse in a jiffy. It bounces off the core at nearly the speed of light. It's an impressive, explosive event called a supernova. The blown out material becomes the basis for future stars. It also leaves behind a black hole. Now that we know a bit about a star's life, let's try to look at each generation, if you'd like. Stars don't just pop up constantly at the same rate. Currently, the universe is manufacturing only about one-ninth the number of stars compared to its star-forming glory days, which happened roughly 10 billion years ago. One study gave us a peek on the history of star forming. In writing it, two scientists teamed up to gather a ton of data about galaxies. They sorted these galaxies based on how far away they were. By doing this, they could track how the brightness of galaxies has changed over the universe's lifetime. Since stars give off most of a galaxy's light, they could use that brightness to figure out how many stars were forming using some fancy math. Their findings confirmed that star formation was pretty wimpy when the universe was young. But as gas started to gather in galaxies, boom! Star formation skyrocketed until about 10 to 11 billion years ago when it hit its peak. After that, star formation took a nosedive. In today's observable universe, it's dropped a lot. That means around 50% of the stars we see today were born in the first 5 billion years post Big Bang. A mere quarter formed in the last 6 billion years. So what's causing this cosmic shift? Well, scientists think it's all about that cold gas that stars need when they're born. When galaxies form, the gas gets concentrated inside, leading to a star formation extravaganza. But then, the gas is used up quickly as stars doze off. When supernovae come into play, they blast away that much needed gas for future star making. Not to mention it also changes the chemistry of that gas. This crucial piece of information could be a starting point for the star-making decline we see today. Scientists are still not sure why this gas becomes useless. Galaxies are also pretty complex to begin with. There are all sorts of forces involved in maintaining their balance. For instance, when a supernova goes boom, the shock waves can sometimes cause turbulence and clumping of the gas, sparking the birth of new stars. But if the supernova is too wild, it can blast that same gas right out of the galaxy. With no gas left in the area, there's little to no chance a new star could form. Now, what does the future hold? Some scientists can't help but wonder what might happen if no new stars pop up. The universe might be simply filled with black holes and fading stars. Solar systems would become inhospitable as their stars lose power and those ravenous black holes might munch on whatever material is left. As gloomy as it seems, you do have to admit it's a mind-boggling concept. Luckily, we don't have to worry about it happening anytime soon. 
The universe is a whopping 13.7 billion years old. But the dark era isn't expected to kick in until somewhere way further in the future. But hey, this is just one possible outcome of the decline in star formation. Who knows what other wacky possibilities the universe holds. It was the year 2017 when astronomers spotted a bright star hurtling out of the Milky Way. It was moving incredibly fast at a speed of 2 million miles per hour. That's almost four times as fast as the Sun orbits around the center of our home Milky Way galaxy. It takes our star more than 225 million years to complete one journey. Anyway, back to our star, the Wanderer. The main issue with it was that it was moving against the direction in which most stars travel around the center of our galaxy. Even more bizarre, it consisted of totally different star stuff. Astronomers managed to identify its composition. The star was made up of heavy metallic atoms. At the same time, most of the other stars consist of way lighter elements. The wandering star got the name LP40365. It was moving so fast that it literally dashed out of our galaxy. This made scientists believe that the space traveler was pushed out of its place by some kind of cosmic disaster, like a supernova. A supernova is the largest explosion that can take place in space, an explosion of a star. It happens after irreversible changes start in the core of a star. Supernovas can occur in two ways, in binary star systems and when there's a single star. Binary stars are two stars orbiting around the same center. At some moment, one of the stars, a very dense white dwarf, starts stealing matter from its companion. After some time, this thief accumulates too much matter, which causes it to explode into a supernova. Or it can be a single star nearing the end of its life. It's running out of its fuel. More and more mass is flowing into the core of the star. In the end, the core becomes so heavy that it fails to withstand its own gravity. After the core collapses, a tremendous amount of energy is released in a supernova. But astronomers still can't figure out how a supernova could send LP40365 flying. There are more questions than answers. Was it a companion star that got flung out by a shockwave created by a supernova? Or was it a piece of the exploded star? A new study based on the collected data has shown that the star, which is a white dwarf, keeps slowly rotating around its axis. Astronomers are almost sure it means LP40365 is indeed just a chunk of space debris, and not a full-fledged star. This wandering piece somehow managed to survive one of the fiercest space events. But after making such a conclusion, scientists realize something amazing. LP40365's unusual features could appear after the star witnessed a supernova. Even though this event happened lightning fast, the entire makeup of the star got changed. Most stars consist mainly of helium and hydrogen, but LP40365 is different. It contains such heavy elements as magnesium, oxygen, and neon. It must have been the supernova that added these atoms to the star's composition. By the way, astronomers consider all elements that are heavier than helium to be metals. This means that after witnessing the supernova, LP40365 became metallic. Right now, the star doesn't have its own planets, but NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is on the lookout for distant planets passing in front of their host stars and dimming them, has noticed a curious thing. LP40365 brightens and then dims again every 8.9 hours. It might mean that the star pulsates, but usually stellar pulsations are much less regular. A more plausible explanation is that the star's surface is uneven. And as it spins, sunspots are brought into and out of view. And it's great news, because after astronomers figure out how fast the star rotates, they can understand what happened to it around 5 million years ago during the supernova. Bright blue exoplanet HD 189733b looks peaceful and eerily familiar. Doesn't it resemble Earth? But this appearance conceals the planet's terrifying nature. There, the winds blow at 5,400 miles per hour. It's seven times the speed of sound. But that's not the worst. It rains glass, sideways, in this scorching, hot world. 
Neutron stars are ultra-dense collapsed cores of giant stars. They emit X-rays or radio waves. But in 2018, astronomers discovered a weird stream of infrared light. It seemed to be coming from a neutron star 800 light-years away from our planet. The most plausible theory is that this signal was probably produced by a disk of dust surrounding the star. But there isn't enough evidence to confirm this idea. Mercury is the fastest planet in the solar system. It zips around the Sun at a breakneck speed of more than 100,000 miles per hour. That's around 40,000 miles per hour faster than our home planet. It's one of the reasons why a year on Mercury equals 88 days on Earth. Mercury is the planet that orbits the closest to the Sun. That's why if you were standing on its surface at its closest approach to our star, the Sun would look more than three times as large as it does on Earth. The Black Widow Pulsar is a rotating neutron star that is munching on its partner, which is a lightweight brown dwarf star. The more material the pulsar consumes, the more slowly it spins. The energy the neutron star is losing in the process causes the companion star to dwindle. There's a stellar nursery in the constellation Centaurus. And even though this place is called a nursery, it's anything but peaceful or safe. It's made up of hydrogen and newborn stars and is located in a nebula around 6,500 light years away from Earth. A nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust floating in space. The intense energy baby stars emit makes hydrogen clouds glow ominous red. This energy is so powerful, it's eating away dark clouds of dust. Astronomers can see them disappear like lumps of butter on a hot frying pan. Faraway Neptune-sized exoplanet Gliese 436b is a paradox. It's made of scorching hot ice, and this ice is burning. The planet completes one full orbit around the red dwarf Gliese 436 in just two days. It means the exoplanet travels very close to its parent star. That might be the reason why the planet's temperatures rarely drop below 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But the strangest thing? The planet hosts huge volumes of water ice, known as Ice X. And this ice remains solid despite such incredibly high temperatures. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It's 318 times as massive as Earth. It's also two and a half times as massive as all other planets of the solar system combined. But here's a paradox. If this gas giant got even more massive, it'd actually become smaller. The added mass would make the planet denser, and this would cause it to start pulling in on itself. Astronomers claim that Jupiter can eventually end up being four times as massive as it is now. But at the same time, its size won't change. DGSAT1 galaxy is as big as the Milky Way, but it's nearly invisible because its stars are spread out incredibly thin. But what makes the galaxy so unique is that it's sitting all alone, unlike other galaxies of this kind. Those are usually found in clusters. It can mean that DGSAT1 was formed in a different era, probably a mere 1 billion years after the Big Bang. If it's true, the galaxy is a real living fossil. Saturn's moon, Hyperion, is one of the most bizarre-looking moons in the solar system. But the appearance isn't the strangest thing about this space body. The pumice stone-like rock is pockmarked with countless craters, and it's also charged with static electricity, which is flowing out into space. About 4,000 light-years away from Earth, there's a planet that seems to be one enormous diamond. The planet is denser than any other discovered so far and consists mostly of carbon. It's so dense that astronomers think this carbon might be crystalline. It means that at least some part of the planet is diamond. Ceres is the most massive space body in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. It totals almost a third of the entire mass of the whole belt. But at the same time, Ceres is the tiniest of the dwarf planets out there. It's also the only dwarf planet that dwells in the asteroid belt and also the only one that is located in the inner solar system. Astronomers sometimes call Jupiter a failed star. The gas giant indeed contains a lot of helium and hydrogen. But its mass isn't enough to start a fusion reaction in its core. And that's exactly how stars produce energy. 
They fuse the atoms of hydrogen together under extreme pressure and heat and create helium. In the process, they also release light and heat. Jupiter could start a nuclear reaction and become a star only if it was 70 times its current mass. Space is completely, eerily silent. That's because in the vacuum of space, there's no atmosphere, and the sound waves need some medium to travel through. That's why worlds with atmospheres like Earth are full of noise. Unlike their massive siblings, hypothetical mini black holes could be really tiny, not bigger than an atom. Even so, just one minuscule thing would have enough mass of a thousand sedans. One theory claims that tons of micro black holes could be created right after the Big Bang. Some scientists even go so far as to say that a couple of mini black holes pass through our planet every day. Every hour, the Sun sends more energy to Earth than our planet uses in a year. Even though people are now using much more solar energy than a decade ago, it's still a mere 0.7% of the world's annual electricity usage. There might be moons orbiting other moons, but astronomers haven't agreed on this theory yet. Planets orbit stars, moons orbit planets. But why can't there be moon moons, also known as submoons, moonettes, and moons? Researchers claim that moon moons could exist, but the host moon has to be massive enough and the moon moon small enough. There must also be a large distance between these moons and the host planet. Jupiter is the most massive planet in the solar system. This means its gravity is also the most intense. It's 2.5 times as great as what we have on our home planet. Once, the gas giant's gravity even tore apart a large comet called Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Then the planet eagerly swallowed the chunks of the former comet. If you were standing at the equator on Mars, the temperature at your feet would feel like that of a warm spring day but your head would be literally freezing. Lost in space and drifting through galaxies, rogue planets were once flung away from their parent stars, but one of them floating 200 light years away from Earth is different from the rest. It's a planet-sized object with a magnetic field 200 times stronger than that of Jupiter. This field is so powerful that it generates never-ending flashing auroras in the planet's atmosphere. Europa is one of Jupiter's largest moons, even though it's smaller than Earth's moon. But the cool thing about this satellite of the gas giant is that it's covered with ice. And some of this ice is smooth, which means you could skate there. And a three-foot axle jump you can perform on our planet would take you 22 feet into the air. At the same time, the landing speed on Europa would be the same as it is on Earth. Haumea, a dwarf planet orbiting the Kuiper Belt, has a bizarre elongated shape and two moons. The day on this planet lasts four hours, making it the fastest spinning large object in the solar system. But the most mysterious thing about Haumea is that the planet has a thin 40-mile wide ring circling it. Astronomers haven't managed to figure out how or why it appeared around the dwarf planet. Eleven Earths could fit across the equator of Jupiter. And if our planet was the size of a grape, the gas giant would be as large as a basketball. Nine spacecraft have already visited Jupiter. Seven of them just flew by, and two orbited the huge planet. The most recent of them, Juno, arrived at Jupiter in 2016. The craters of the moon's south pole are likely to be the frostiest place in the whole solar system. The crater's floors are always in the shadow. That's why the temperature never rises above 397 degrees Fahrenheit, even during the day. If you decided to fly a plane to Pluto, your journey would take around 800 years. You'll find the highest mountain in the solar system on an asteroid called Vesta. Its peak rises 14 miles above the base of the mountain. This makes Rye Silvia, that's what the mountain is called, almost three times taller than Everest. Saturn's rings weren't discovered all at once. It happened gradually. That's why they were named alphabetically in the order scientists found them. Now they go like this. D, C, B, A, F, G, and E. A day on Venus is around 243 Earth days long. But the bad news is that you'd have to wait for a weekend for three years. 
all because a day on Venus is longer than its year. A solar phenomenon called Terminator Events is taking place at the Sun's equator. Disastrous magnetic field collisions seem to cause ginormous twin tsunamis of plasma. These tsunamis tear across the star's surface, moving at a speed of 1,000 feet per second. They can last for weeks at a time and happen almost every decade. The winds on Neptune are the fastest in our solar system. Most of them can reach the speed of 1,600 miles per hour. Almost any of these enormous storms could easily swallow our entire planet. The 18th brightest star in the night sky, Fomalhaut, is a terrifying sight. It's dubbed the Eye of Sauron because a ring of dust and debris circling it makes it look like a giant eye staring into your soul. The intimidating star is more than twice the mass of our Sun and is 25 light years away from Earth, which isn't that far away considering distances in space. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, the planet's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart. It'll probably result in the formation of a ring around Mars. An asteroid the size of a car enters the atmosphere of our planet every year. Such an intruder could wipe out a small town off the face of the Earth. Dust and smoke would rise into the atmosphere, preventing sunlight from reaching the surface of the planet. It would cause the temperatures all over the world to drop and the climate would change. Luckily, such asteroids burn in the atmosphere before they even come close to the surface. The radio signal produced by a spacecraft when it contacts Earth is less powerful than a light bulb in your fridge. By the time this signal reaches our planet, its power is only one billionth of one billionth of a watt. No wonder that antennas gathering these super weak signals are huge. The deep space network that detects signals from spacecraft has dish antennas that measure up to 230 feet across. That's more than the width of a soccer field. In 1999, NASA lost a Mars orbiter because one engineering team was using the metric system and another was doing calculations with the help of the imperial system. Nebulas are giant clouds of gas and dust. With time, gravity starts to pull these clumps of dust and gas together. They grow larger and larger. And their gravity gets more powerful. One day, a nebula's mass becomes so great that it collapses under its own gravity and forms a new star. Around 4,000 light years away, in the constellation of Scorpion, there is the Butterfly Nebula. Its wingspan is greater than three light years, and the structure inside the nebula is one of the most complicated ever observed. The nebula's central star, a white dwarf, is heated to an insane 450,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This means it was formed from another huge star, likely more than five times the size of our Sun. The white dwarf is surrounded by a thick disk of dust and gas at the equator. That's what probably makes the whole structure look like an hourglass or a butterfly. If you decided to lump together all the known asteroids in the solar system, their total mass wouldn't exceed even 10% of the mass of our moon. A cloud of water vapor is floating in space. It surrounds a supermassive black hole 12 billion light years away from Earth. The cloud contains 140 trillion times the entire volume of water on our planet. Astronomers think this water cloud appeared just 1.6 billion years later than the universe itself. The densest objects in space are neutron stars. They are the size of a small city. Yet their mass is about 1.4 times the mass of our sun. A single teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh a billion tons. And a neutron star's gravity is 2 billion times stronger than the gravity of our planet. In 1993, the Galileo probe was traveling past a miniature asteroid. It was no more than 20 miles across. And still, the tiny thing had a one-mile-wide moon. Astronomers have discovered tons of moons orbiting minor planets in the solar system since then. We live inside the Sun. The star's atmosphere stretches way beyond its visible surface, and our planet is well within its reach. That's how the gust of the solar wind creates such a breathtaking phenomenon as the northern and southern lights.
A powerful burst of gamma radiation lasted a mere half second, but it released an enormous amount of energy. It was more than our sun would produce in 10 billion years. This brief flash lit up the whole sky. Afterward, a much softer and more long-lasting glow replaced it. Astronomers examined the phenomenon with X-ray, radio, optical, and infrared waves. It turned out that people had finally seen a newborn magnetar for the first time ever. It was likely formed after two neutron stars had merged. It resulted in a kilonova, one of the brightest and largest stellar blasts. Its light finally reached our planet on May 22, 2020. Imagine a massive star, at least five times the mass of our sun, reaching the end of its life. It might be because it's run out of its nuclear fuel. If it happens, the star starts to cool off, the pressure inside drops, and the gravity starts to squeeze inward. And then, more than a million times the mass of our planet collapses within 15 seconds. It happens so fast that an enormous shock wave causes the outer part of the star to blow up. It produces a blinding burst of light. This powerful blast is called a supernova. What's left behind is an incredibly dense core with a huge cloud of hot gas, called a nebula, expanding around it. If the star has been massive enough, more than 10 times the size of the sun, it's likely to turn into a black hole. If not, it turns into a neutron star. It's basically a giant nucleus, the central part of an atom. These stars are mostly made up of neutrons and are rarely larger than 20 miles across. For comparison, our sun is almost 865,000 miles across, which is 109 Earths put side by side. But don't let this relatively tiny size fool you. Any neutron star is at least one and a half times heavier than our sun and has an intense magnetic field. If you scooped just a teaspoon of this star's insides, this matter would weigh more than a billion tons. It's so dense that it makes neutron stars some of the most extreme objects people know about. The next stop is the black hole itself. When two neutron stars merge, they most often create a new, much heavier one. Within milliseconds, or even less, this star collapses into a black hole. But the astronomers who examined the flash of light recorded in March think there might be another outcome. They're almost sure they saw something never observed before the birth of a magnetar. That's a rare form of a neutron star with an ultra-strong magnetic field. It's 1,000 trillion times stronger than our planets. This field is also so powerful, it heats the star's surface up to 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. To put it simply, magnetars are the most powerful magnets in the universe. Their magnetic fields can seriously mess with the neighborhood. Atoms, unlucky enough to get close to such a star, get stretched into pencil-thin lines. If you somehow found yourself several hundred miles away from a magnetar, it would end badly for you. The magnetic field would first disrupt your bioelectricity. It means that your nerve impulses wouldn't work anymore. Even your molecules would change under the influence of the star's field. In the end, you'd pretty much vanish. If a magnetar flew within 100,000 miles from our planet, it would wipe out all the data on every single credit card in the world. Arcturus, a huge red star. It's just bursting from inside out. The red sea of plasma on its surface rages and pulsates. The star burns anything that comes close to it. And now, flop, Arcturus is gone. But at the same moment, it reappears at the center of our solar system, replacing the sun. What we see in the sky isn't a small yellow dot anymore, but a giant red ball. It's 25 times wider and 30% heavier than the sun. Even though Arcturus is a little cooler, it's still a total nightmare for Earth. The distance from our planet to the star is now 25 times less. All the water in the oceans and rivers begins to evaporate. What used to be rainforests are quickly turning into a lifeless desert. But sunsets and sunrises now look amazing. Imagine yourself on the roof of the Empire State Building, watching the sunrise. First, you see the light over the horizon. It almost blinds you, because Arcturus is 110 times brighter than the sun. Then, the star gradually climbs over the surface. The thick dot on the horizon gets wider and wider. It continues to grow, until the red star is everything you can see. 
Arcturus is now so close that you can even see storms of hot plasma on its surface. There are periodic outbursts and mass ejections. Huge amounts of matter are ejected from the surface of the star at speeds of up to 1,200 miles per second. The matter takes the form of a loop attached to the star at both ends. And you have to wear a super-advanced spacesuit to be able to observe such a sunrise. Life on Earth ceased to exist long ago under these conditions, and it's going to get worse over time, because every eight days, Arcturus's brilliance increases, and soon, our planet will become more like Venus. It's so close to the Sun that the high temperature makes any life there impossible. Okay, let's let our planet cool down a bit and put Proxima Centauri in the center of our solar system. It's not a red giant, but a red dwarf. This star is almost seven times smaller than the Sun and almost nine times lighter. Now our oceans and rivers are not evaporating, but freezing over. Forests and jungles are covered with snow. In about a week, there won't be a single place on Earth where the temperature is above freezing. Even plants that are used to the cold will cease to exist. They mostly feed on the sun's energy. Now, they begin to starve. But there will still be water deep beneath the ice layer. It'll be heated by the hot core of our planet. Microorganisms will still be able to survive. It's much darker on Earth, too. It's like an endless twilight here. Oh, and we can barely see the moon. The thing is, it doesn't produce its own light, but reflects it from the bright sun. With Proxima Centauri instead, the moon will lose its brightness. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. But an even bigger problem would be with our orbit. The sun has a certain gravitational force, and it keeps us just in the sweet habitable zone, where we're not too hot and not too cold. Proxima Centauri's gravity is much weaker, and Earth is slowly drifting away from the star. We now run the risk of encountering asteroids flying through space, or even other planets. But the worst case scenario is if Proxima Centauri simply can't hold our planet, and we fly away into dark space. Then, you can forget about any forms of life here. Now, let's put Sirius at the center of our solar system. It's the brightest star in our night sky. It's only 70% bigger than the sun, but almost twice as hot. So its glow is not only bright, it's sizzling. And its light is not yellow, but somewhere between blue and white. You couldn't go out in the city without sunglasses, or serious glasses. <laughs> Still, you wouldn't want to walk the streets, where the asphalt is boiling anyway. You could literally fry eggs on the curb. Of course, by this time, all life on Earth has long since disappeared. But it's not just because of the temperature. Sirius emits enormous amounts of radiation. Our atmosphere serves as a shield against the sun. But in the case of Sirius, that shield wouldn't be enough. Now, why don't we take a more bizarre approach and make ourselves a double star system. These are two stars that revolve around a common center. And there's our Earth, safe and sound. It's all about the size and brightness of the stars. These two aren't too big, and they give off as much light as our Sun. All that matters to us is that our planet is in the safe zone of the double star system. At sunrise, you first see one star appear from below the horizon, and then, a couple of minutes later, the other. The only problem is that this beauty may soon explode with enormous force. In binary systems, one star is always heavier than its companion. Sooner or later, it starts pulling matter away from the smaller star. Gradually, the bigger star just eats its neighbor. Then the big brother can reach a critical mass and explode. This explosion would be about as strong as a supernova it would destroy our entire solar system. The light from this explosion would be visible for hundreds of light years away. And after that, there would be a huge nebula in the place of our star system. It's stardust and particles that are left from our world. Going to the realm of the crazy now, a black hole. Yes, there's one at the center of our solar system now. We know black holes are scary, mysterious objects that pull in everything in their path. But even around a black hole, there is a habitable zone. 
You just have to be far enough away so that it doesn't drag you down into its black abyss. Mercury and Venus would be too close to the black hole. So, most likely, they'd be torn apart and then head for the event horizon. This is the last stop before hitting the singularity, the heart of the black hole. There are only two problems, light and time. A black hole pulls light in instead of emitting it, so the Earth will quickly become dark and cold. And time goes slower around heavy objects. Near a black hole, one second can be equal to weeks or even months away in outer space. We won't feel this difference, but the entire universe around us will develop faster relative to us. Any object can become a black hole if it's compressed to a certain size. For example, the Sun can become one if it's shrunk to a width of 3.7 miles. And even the Earth, if you squeeze it to a width of 0.7 inches, it becomes a black hole. Oh, now there's some little rock lurking in the center of our solar system. It's a neutron star. It's about 18 miles wide. Some meteorites are much bigger than that. But it has a mass comparable to the Sun. So its gravitational force is about the same, and our planet's orbit is intact. But the problem is that neutron stars emit next to no visible light. So it's now permanent night on Earth. Still, it gets very hot here. When a neutron star is born, it can be several times hotter than the Sun at first, but it quickly cools down to the temperature we're used to. So there's a chance that all life on Earth hasn't yet been scorched. Another problem is that these little guys are rapidly spinning and can become pulsars. It's kind of like a powerful spotlight on two sides of a spinning star. Neutron stars also eject radiation at tremendous speeds. These rays will make our planet literally sterile. No life form would be able to exist under these conditions. And now, it's time for the biggest star ever known, Stevenson 218. This red giant is 2,150 times larger than the Sun. And if we place it at the center of our solar system, its edge will lie on Saturn's orbit. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter are already swallowed by the huge star. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are roasting like chestnuts on a fire and will soon evaporate. In fact, this could happen to our Sun as well. The older it gets, the redder and bigger it becomes. It'll eventually run out of its fuel, hydrogen, and the Sun will start to burn heavier elements in its core. This will cause it to expand. Then we'll see more beautiful sunsets and sunrises, but the temperature will become too high. In theory, the Sun will get so big that it'll swallow the Earth. And then, it'll explode in a supernova, leaving nothing of our entire solar system behind. Shiny! Hop on board! Hurry, we don't have much time! We're on a cosmic journey to find the biggest star in the universe. The first star we pass is our own sun. By far, not the biggest one out there, but it's still massive. You could fit one million Earths inside it. That means if you think of the sun like a basketball, Earth would be half the size of a pencil eraser. If we put all the planets on one side of a scale and the sun on the other, the planets wouldn't stand a chance. The Sun makes up 99.9% .9 of all the mass in the entire solar system. Mass is basically how much stuff or matter something is made from. And it's what you can thank for stars shining. You see, the more matter in a star, the thicker and hotter its core becomes. This starts a chain of chemical reactions. Hydrogen atoms get smashed into each other to form helium, releasing an incredible amount of energy. That's the star's light and heat. So, bigger stars also equal brighter ones. But with all those reactions going on, this shortens a star's lifespan. When it starts to run out of fuel, the star will enter the giant phase. It'll expand and turn red. Which brings us back to the task at hand. The biggest star we'll find is likely to be on the edge of its life. Switching on our hyper light engines, we soon arrive at the Lumen 16 system. Here, we'll find one of the smallest stars out there, a brown dwarf. 
Small here means about the size of Jupiter, but they're small for stars. Brown dwarfs are also called failed stars because they don't have enough mass for those chemical reactions. That means they're not as bright, but they're super dense. All the matter in them is packed together so tightly, they weigh 80 times more than Jupiter, even being the same size. Huh, and if you think that's something, just look at a white dwarf, even more tightly packed. This one here is Sirius B. It's also about the size of Jupiter, but it'd weigh as much as the Sun. It emits a dim white light. Once it runs out of gas, it'll turn red and cool down. Now let's fly closer to its giant neighbor, Sirius A. You easily see this star from Earth, no telescope needed. Twice heavier and more than one and a half times wider than our Sun, it's the brightest star in our night sky. Now we fly 550 light years away from Earth to the constellation Cassiopeia. Almost a hundred years ago, a cosmic explosion happened here. It expanded the atmosphere of the star Gamma Cassiopeia and some gases were thrown into space. After that, it became the brightest star in the constellation. It's ten times wider than our Sun. On to the famous North Star. Funny enough, different stars have had this title over the years, and more will take it in the future. That's because Earth's pole star changes every 26,000 years. Imagine our planet like a spinning top. The northern pole will shift around in a little circle, pointing at different stars to the true north. The current one is a supergiant 37 times wider and 5 times heavier than our Sun. It's easy to find in the night sky. It's on the very tip of the Little Dipper's handle. Get ready now! We're setting off for the eye of the storm, the center of our Milky Way galaxy. To see the next star, we need to switch to infrared mode. This pistol star is hiding from us in space dust. In just 20 seconds, it emits as much light as our home star does in an entire year. And its size is jaw-dropping. It's 420 times wider than the Sun. But it's still not the most luminous star known to humanity. That would be a blue supergiant in the constellation Triangulum. Meet B416. It's almost 10 million times brighter than the Sun. But the brighter a star, the faster it burns up all its fuel and the shorter its life. Compared with a red dwarf that barely glows and burns fuel much more slowly, its life will be hundreds of thousands of times shorter. 3,400 light years from Earth, there's one of the rarest celestial bodies in the universe. It's a yellow hypergiant called Rho Cassiopeia. Among the countless stars in our galaxy, there are only a couple dozen of these. And even though this star is extremely far away from our planet, you can still see it in the sky without needing a telescope. That's because it's 300,000 times brighter than our Sun. It also helps that the thing is 900 times wider than our home star, too. And its color tells us that its fuel reserves will last for a long time. When Rho Cassiopeia starts to turn red and expand, it'll be one of the biggest stars in the entire universe. Now, we move to the constellation Orion. The star is in our sights. Betelgeuse, one of the largest ones visible to the unaided eye. 700 times the size of our Sun. If it took our star's place, its surface would touch the asteroid belt. That's between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. It would engulf the four inner planets, Earth included. But this star has astronomers very excited. They predict Betelgeuse will explode in a fantastic celestial show in the next 10,000 years. It'll be the greatest astronomical event of all time because we'll be able to observe a supernova at a close but safe enough distance. The exploding star will shine as bright as a half moon. It'll be visible in the daytime sky for a year and at night for several more. Now we venture to stars that exceed the sun's width 1,000 times. Mu Cephei is a hypergiant boasting the title of the reddest known star. Its color tells us that the fuel gauge is getting closer and closer to empty. But it's still so big that it could hold a billion suns in it. And because of its mass, this star will eventually become a supernova or even a black hole. Let's take a trip of almost 4,000 light years from home. 
Here it is, a red supergiant called VY Canis Majoris. It's one of the biggest and brightest stars of the Milky Way. It could fit 3 billion suns. And even though it's so huge, this thing is surprisingly light, only 17 weights of the sun. In the context of celestial bodies, you could call this star an inflated balloon. In the next 100,000 years, VY Canis Majoris will explode in a hypernova. Gamma radiation will destroy all life in the local part of the universe. But this star is so far from our solar system that it wouldn't mean any harm to us. If we placed MY Cephei in the center of our solar system, it would bulge all the way out to Saturn's orbit. To remind you just how far away Saturn is, think of it this way. It takes the sun's light eight minutes to reach Earth. To get to Saturn, it takes well over an hour. Compared to this massive star, the sun is just a grain of sand. It's one of the most luminous and reddest stars in our universe. The bigger and redder the star, the closer it is to its end. So, we're not looking at just a titan of the universe, but also one of the oldest celestial bodies out there. The second biggest star in the universe is UI Scuti. It's about 1.5 billion miles wide, 16 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This is a pulsating variable star. Its brightness changes about every two years. UI Scuti is a record breaker in fuel combustion per year. Scientists expect it to evolve back to hotter temperatures like a yellow giant. Our journey is coming to an end. Before us, we behold Stevenson 218. It takes 20,000 years for light from this star to reach Earth. It's hard not to see this red supergiant on our tiny terrestrial home. It's 2,150 times wider than our sun. We'd need 10 billion suns to fill its volume. For comparison, the average beach contains only about 5 billion grains of sand. To see one of the most significant astronomical events of all time, we go to South America. In the Atacama Desert, Chile, we find the most advanced technology for space observation. Here, the Royal Astronomical Community members watch for six months as a black hole simply absorbed a massive star. By the way, these are the same scientists who prove that in the center of our Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole, and even took a photo of it. For the first time in history, this incredible event happened very close to Earth. Well, the distance of 215 million light years is considered quite close in astronomy terms anyway. Light from this event reached our planet in September of 2019, and even the most experienced scientists dropped their jaws in surprise. Imagine a star the size of our Sun, about 860,000 miles wide. Such stars have enough weight to create a strong gravitational field holding many planets in their orbit. And now, let's place a giant black hole next to it. The hole is absolutely black, shaped like a disk, and weighs a billion times more than this star. The force of its gravitational field is incredible. Nothing can leave its gravity force. Objects that can move at the speed of light will still fall into this black abyss. Even light itself cannot escape its boundaries. As soon as a star enters the gravitational field of a black hole, it has no chance. At first, it tries to resist the pull of the black hole. Still, the star's outer layers begin to stretch toward the black hole just like spaghetti. This is due to a powerful force of attraction. If you had the opportunity to extend your hand toward the black hole, hmm. you would see your fingers begin to stretch and elongate. This is because the force of attraction increases with every inch. Therefore, it acts stronger on your fingers than on your arm. That's why this process of pulling objects into a black hole is called spaghettification. The first thing to be sucked into the black hole is the star's crown. This is the outer shell of the star, which consists of hot plasma. You may notice how the star begins to shrink in size. This is because that plasma makes up most of the visible sun. When this hot plasma spaghetti reaches the black hole, it may appear to remain on the disk's edge and continue to orbit the black hole. But in fact, there is no turning back anymore. 
the star's particles have already hit the event horizon of the dark abyss. The gravitational field of a black hole bends light around its edges, so the event horizon looks a bit like a croissant for the observer. Boy, lots of food metaphors here. I'm getting hungry. You may also notice a kind of chaos in this ring, as if some light particles are moving in one direction and others in another. This happens because of a mirror effect. But you can be sure that whatever reaches the event horizon will, sooner or later, be pulled into the singularity, or the black pearl of the black hole. Another illusion you spot is the star particles in the event horizon moving slower. The truth is that supermassive objects like a black hole curve space-time around them. And the more massive the object, the slower time flows near it. If you hang one watch beside a black hole and another on a wall in your bedroom, you will see that the second hand in the first watch barely moves, while a whole day passes on Earth. As observers, it seems to us that the particles of light have slowed their movement. But in fact, they may have already been absorbed by the black hole ages ago. Now, massive streams of red-hot plasma splash into space, just like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> when a black hole has absorbed star material, it emits powerful rays of energy at a rate of about 6,200 miles per second. This release of energy is accompanied by an intense flash. It's thanks to this flash that scientists can even detect this process in the first place. This phenomenon can be observed when a supernova explodes. When nothing remains of the star's body, we can still see stardust and other particles in the black holes of an horizon. Kind of like the Parmesan cheese sprinkled on the spaghetti. Hey, stop me if I'm taking this too far. When the process of spaghettification is completed, about half of the star's weight has been thrown into outer space as dust and glowing particles. The other half was entirely absorbed by the black hole. The scientists observed this process for almost six months. But what would be more interesting is to dive into a black hole yourself. Well, we can't do that yet, but we can simulate this process. Here's a little drone, our metal friend, kind of like a meatball. No, I haven't had lunch yet. Right now, it's at a safe distance from the black hole, the length of about three widths of the event horizon. Objects at this distance can orbit the black hole safely. A little closer, and it'll be swallowed up by a dark infinity. So our destroyed star could have safely existed at this distance. Moreover, planets can live at this distance. And if there is a suitable source of light and heat somewhere nearby, life can exist on these planets too. But our goal is the singularity, and we guide the meatball, I mean the drone, closer to the event horizon. After a few minutes, the force of attraction begins to strengthen, and the drone starts to stretch like spaghetti. When it begins spinning around the black disk, it means it has reached the event horizon and has started its descent into the black abyss. Now, let's look at everything from the drone's perspective. All the light from the stars that it sees becomes blue. This is called gravitational blue shift. As it falls into the black hole, its gravitational field pulls the photons of light down, giving them energy. Their wavelengths grow shorter, so the red photons change into blue. The drone continues to fall and is already completely hidden from our eyes. And all that the robot sees is a bright, thin blue beam. Now it's in complete darkness. There's absolutely nothing here, not even time. Here, time goes so slowly that our entire solar system could grow old and cease to exist during a minute spent in a black hole. But our drone will live until its battery is empty. Hey, the drone sees a small bundle of light again, and it's getting closer and more prominent. Now the drone will experience the same fall, only in reverse. Once the drone leaves the singularity, the heart of the black hole, it will be on the event horizon once again. The light from the stars gradually changes from blue to red. Then the drone is thrown into outer space, perhaps in some faraway galaxy. Well, returning from a black hole is just a theory. Some people think that black holes are a kind of wormhole that can lead us to distant places in space. But so far, these theories are considered fiction. Black holes are quite challenging to detect. 
The problem is, they are, well, black, just like space. They don't emit light like stars, so they can only be detected by gravity anomalies. Despite this, scientists believe there are a vast numbers of black holes in our universe. They're born when a massive star collapses under its own weight. And given the infinite number of stars in the universe, black holes are probably a common phenomenon. Scientists believe black holes have their own lifetimes. This is because of Hawking radiation. A black hole loses mass, and so, to continue existing, it has to absorb massive objects, like the star we just watched. But if the black hole lives in deep space, it has less to absorb and will most likely begin to shrink until it just disappears. Like this plate of spaghetti. Mmm. <laughs>